please help me welcome Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. Well, again, it's such an honor to have you here in Colorado, and I just want to thank you for taking the time to be with us here today. Well, thank you so much. It is my pleasure and honor to be here, and I have to say, I am just so impressed with everything that I have seen so far, so congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's dive right in. I mean, one of the things I've had a chance to talk to you over the last couple of days that I so admire, and I think it's such a... a great approach to what can feel like sort of an overwhelming progress problem, this idea of toxic stress. And so I really appreciate that you sort of treat it like, a pre you talk about it pragmatically um, and talk about it like other medical issues in a clinical practice. And again, I think this approach helps us take an issue that sort of could sound insurmountable and breaks it into something that we can feel like we can do something about. So can you say more about your work and what you see so far as some of the biggest successes of this approach? Um, sure. So um, our work focuses on using the science of how exposure to trauma and adversity affect the developing brains and bodies of children and trying to translate that into effective into solutions, frankly. And uh, our organization, the Center for Youth Wellness, we uh, do work in three different realms. We have a, a clinical team with families in Bayview Hunters Point, really working on uh, developing a clinical model to address uh, toxic stress. We also have um, a research arm to be able to evaluate that and also look into the most promising science and use that to inform our clinical work. And we have a policy arm and, and uh, to be able to lift up and support best practices um, and, and share what we're learning nationally. And so I would say probably one of the most, um, the thing that I'm most proud of is it, it's stuff that people would never get to see. Um, it's my patients. I, um, I saw one of my uh, adolescent boys um, recently and just following up uh, with him. And this was a, a child who had really, really severe asthma and also really bad behavioral problems. He was referred to me for um, ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And when we understood that really what was going on was all of the traumatic experiences in his household, and we're able to get supports for him and for his caregiver. And to see him now, four years later, he's on the honor roll in school. And I haven't treated an asthma exacerbation in years. You know, just that for me um, is the fuel that keeps me going. And it's, um, it's not like a big success, but that's the work. I think that's the proof in the pudding. I would say the lives behind the data are a pretty big success. So I think that's wonderful. Let's talk a little more about the science um, that, that you are using to, to make these impacts. Um, your approach to really mitigating um, childhood adverse experiences is grounded in brain science in early childhood. So can you say a little bit more about just how adversity in children's lives shapes their brains and eventually later life experiences? And also maybe talk a little bit about why ACEs, why adverse childhood experiences? Sure. Um, at the risk of geeking out a little bit, because I am... We can handle it. <laughs> this room like I, am a, I am a physician scientist to my core. Don't let the high heels fool you. Um, <laughs> um, so it, it, really the foundation is around um, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, your brain's um, fight or flight system, your stress response system. And, you know, what I often say is you're, imagine you're walking in the forest and you see a bear, right? Your hypothalamus sends a signal to your pituitary, which sends a signal to your adrenal gland uh, to say, you know, release stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol. And that's really good. That is life-saving. 
But the problem is what happens when this system is activated over and over and over again, and it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to maladaptive or health-damaging. And um, one of the things that happens when you have that uh, fight-or-flight response is that you also activate the immune system, and that leads to inflammation. And when the system is activated over and over and over again, what you get is chronic inflammation. And that's part of the reason why we see that folks with seven or more adverse childhood experiences have three and a half time the lifetime risk of ischemic heart disease, which is the number one killer in the United States of America. They also have triple the risk of lung cancer, and they also have a 20-year difference in their life expectancy. And um, in addition to the fact that uh, you have this um, uh, chronic inflammation, your children's brains are, the development of children's brains, as you know, many of the folks who work with young children here know, is experience dependent. And the way, the mechanism of the way that our brains are experience dependent is that when you have a, cer a certain amount of a, a certain stimulus, for example, um, it, it can activate or deactivate the way that you read, the, the way that you read your uh, DNA and says which DNA sequence are going to be turned on and off to be read. And it's something called epigenetic regulation. It doesn't change your genetic code, but it is above the genome, so epigenetic. And it just changes, um, for example, like which programs in your DNA are gonna be activated. And so what we find is that for kids who have been um, exposed to high doses of adversity, it actually changes um, the brain's stress responsivity. So it changes the receptors in the brain for things like um, uh, stress hormone receptors, et cetera. And then the final piece is a change to the brain architecture, which is, you know, if you imagine that you're in that forest and there is that bear, if you were to think about it, right, <laughs> you'd look at the bear, you'd be like, dang, he's a couple hundred pounds, he's got teeth, he's got claws, maybe I shouldn't fight him, right? But you got babies in the bushes, so you're gonna take off, turn off the thinking part of your brain. You're gonna downregulate your prefrontal cortex. You're gonna upregulate the parts of your brain that uh, are activated by fear, so places like your amygdala, and the locus ceruleus, which is the within the brain stress activation center and you're gonna get wild, and you're gonna fight that bear. And that's great if you're in the forest, but it's a real problem when you're a six-year-old and you're sitting in your first grade classroom and the kid next to you hits you, right? And so this is where what we're seeing is that kids who have been exposed to high doses of adversity, the canary in the coal mine oftentimes is behavior and learning. If your prefrontal cortex is downregulated, you can have a wonderfully enriched program. It's gonna be really difficult for kids to be able to absorb that because their physiology is actively downregulating the, the thinking part of their brain. And so using the science to figure out how do we take that pressure of a stressful and traumatic environment off of these children, how do we, number one, screen for it, and then develop effective interventions? I think um, we have the opportunity to make significant advances in both health, development, and education. Thank you. So taking that context and bringing it more, one of the things I love about the work you're doing at the center is you think about things, as you described earlier, from both the scientific level and then your interactions with your patients to sort of the public policy level. And also, um, you've called the issue of, of toxic stress and, and the impact on young children and the, their futures a uh, public health crisis. Can you say more about that? Yeah. So. Um you know, after I graduated medical school and before I started my, my residency at Stanford, I did a master's in public health. And the thing that they teach you, public health 101, you sit down in the class day one, right, is that um, if you, let's say you see, um, you know, you're a doctor, you see 100 kids and they all drink from the same well and 95 of them develop diarrhea, right? You can you know, write that dose of 
dose after dose after dose of antibiotics, right? Like you can do that. Or you can go over and be like, what's in the well, right? <laughs> And so this was, uh, it, it's, it's really neat. I think that this is the, the, the thing I'm really grateful for about uh, the pu my public health training is that I could say in my clinic in Hunter's Point and be, you know, fighting this uphill battle with child after child after child or recognize that this is an issue for kids in Hunter's Point, in Newark, in <laughs> you know, <laughs> in Detroit, in, you, all over. And in fact, you know, uh, my team just looked at the data in California, and 16.1% um, of Californians have four or more adverse childhood experiences. I'm not talking about one. 16.1%, that's one in six people in California have four or more adverse childhood experiences. And in some counties, it's, uh, it's 30%. In our highest counties, it's 30%. And so looking at that, it really helps us think, okay, well, how are we going to develop solutions? These solutions have to be, um, if, if we have a public health problem, then it's actually really good news, right? Like people freak out because they're like, oh my God, it's such a big problem. But it's actually really good news because we actually know how to do public health solutions, right? We know that if you want to solve a public health problem, that you have to have these kind of intersector collaborations, that you have to um, have incredible uh, uh, policy direction and support to be able to put together the infrastructure. So you have to figure out, okay, how are we going to screen? And then who's going to follow up on it? And what are people's responsibilities? And who's accountable? And how does the school talk to the doctor's office? And all of these different things. And we do that right now with, um, you know, pe people have to get their TB test, <laughs> right? That's a public health issue. And we don't wait until someone is consumed with tuberculosis before we say, let's treat it, right? Which is kind of what we're doing now with this issue. We're waiting until kids are symptomatic before we respond. What we do is we say, we know it's a huge public health problem. We know it can be spread from one person to the other. Let's test people for TB. Let's screen them. And if it's positive, they get medicines, right? And, and, and so we address this, and the school has the policy that says, you know, you have to have your TB test before you come to school and all that kind of stuff. And so um, I think that's what's exciting for me about um, understanding this as a public health crisis, is that um, it really clarifies that there's, there is a way forward to getting to really substantial change. I love how you can make a public health crisis feel like something that we're all like, yeah, you know, that's a pretty uh, challenging thing to do, and I love your, I love your spirit around that. Getting even more specific about this, you know, thinking about the policies, are there, when you've traveled the country or just thinking about what's going on in California, um, and we have policymakers in the room, we have a lot of folks that work, work at the policy level, what do you think, what have you learned um, are some maybe promising policies, and are there also blocks that you see that you, wanna, you want us to break through to, to really create an environment where this, this work can thrive and we can do more of it and, and better? Yeah, I think that around adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress, um, there's, there are a lot of questions in the policy realm, particularly because um, the science is still emerging. I think a lot of us are saying, well, do we have a solution? And if we don't feel like we have a clear-cut clinical solution, does that mean that we can't screen and all of this type of stuff? And I think that one thing that we do know about um, public, successful public health movements um, uh, tobacco being one, right, is that you have to start with um, national public awareness, widespread public awareness. And I think that is a place where there's low-hanging fruit already out there. I think a lot of folks don't know the, the, uh, this information that early adversity not only um, leads to, you know, increased... It, problems in school and all this other stuff, but it also leads to heart disease and cancer. I think a lot of folks don't know that. Um, I think that um, in terms of uh, some of the most promising work that I have seen nationally is really 
on the policy level, bringing together key stakeholders, each of whom who have some concrete piece of the puzzle that they can move forward and really supporting them to be able to do that. And I think that's been successful in Iowa. It's been successful in California. We just, um, uh, the Center for Youth Wellness uh, uh, supported some legislation in California um, to get adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress recognized as a major public health threat, right? Now, is it, there's no, that was just kind of one baby step forward, but it, it helps to step the, set the stage in terms of recognizing that um, when we think about where we wanna be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, you know, my mind, I like to work backwards from there and say, well, what would we need to get there? And then begin thinking about what policy infrastructure is necessary to do that. Yeah, and I think it's encouraging for, to hear you being what I would consider a true visionary in this work saying, and a lot of this is going to be incremental change. And we just keep coming back and we keep coming back. And so that's inspiring. Um, you mentioned partnerships, um, and so maybe you could just talk a little bit about the partnerships that you and the Center for Youth Wellness have forged with the community, um, and maybe some lessons of your experience in those partnerships as we think about how we approach our work to affect change collectively. So one of the unique uh, privileges of our work is that we are community-based, and, um, and that a lot of this work, for me, in particular has come out of um, kind of being the community doc. Um, in fact, there was only one pediatrician in Baby Hunters Point before I, I started the practice, and then about a year later, he went out of practice. So then, <laughs> so then I was the one pediatrician. And, um, and uh, so when we started uh, this work and recognized this as a crisis, not only for our communities, but for other communities, um, one of the things that was really important for us was involving the community in coming up with solutions. I think oftentimes um, it's easy to talk about problems that are experienced by low-income communities of color and, and come up with a bunch of great solutions and then tell them what your great solutions are. And um, one of the things that we did that our team did that I think was really successful was as we recently hosted the first California statewide summit on adverse childhood experiences, um, we, invent, we invited members of our community advisory council to participate. So we had, um, you know, the secretary of HHS and um, state, uh, our, some of our senators and the chief justice of the California Supreme Court kind of sitting in the same room as a, a mom and a grandma who hear gunshots on their street on the daily, right? And one of the, the things that came out, you know, someone suggested, okay, we're, we're gonna, if we figure out how to get screening and then we get, need to get plugged, every, everyone plugged into mental health services. And, you know, one of the grandmas said, in my community, mental health services is really stigmatizing. Like, people don't wanna go. And so one of the things that they do really well at the Center for Youth Wellness is that the mental health services are at your doctor's office. So when you leave the house and you're say, waving to your neighbor, you're like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna go see, you know, I'm going to go see Dr. Burke, right? And you, then you can come in, you get your mental health services, you, you get everything, but it's also part of, I think, um, for, the, for the family conceptualizing that they're going to address the child's health and then also um, a way to address some of the barriers to accessing care. Thank you. Um, your work is really grounded in a commitment to combating disparities in health. And you and I had a chance to talk about this. I think people in the room are very familiar with the fact that um, disparities is a, is a very troubling theme in Colorado. We have a lot of kids doing really well and a lot of kids who are really struggling. And I think there, we recognize this and there's really some great work underway here to tackle issues of equity in health incomes, outcomes, incomes, that's a Freudian <laughs> slip because that's, that's an issue for us. But it seems there are different ways to approach the issue of equity. So what does equity in health mean to you? And what approaches do you think show the most promise for addressing health disparities? Yeah, ooh, that is a good, that's a tough question. Um, so, 
I'll answer that in saying that as a clinician, when I was, um, when I'm sitting in clinic and um, when I, this issue of early adversity and toxic stress and how it affects health over the lifetime, um, for me, was a huge, huge, huge um, uh, disparities issue. Because I, I think that when you, when you look at the data around, um, I, when you look at the data around a lot of different types of health disparities, trying to understand that, you know, from the time, you know, uh, Margaret Heckler was uh, secretary of HHS and she issued the report on health disparities in the United States and found out that like, you know, particularly with um, black and brown communities that we still had the perpetuation of the slave health deficit, right? And I'm just like, oh my God, that's crazy. And we look at that. I am not going to say that the experience of trauma is the whole thing, but if you are, if we are not incorporating the differential dose of adversity that certain communities experience, then we're not looking at the whole picture. And that's one of the things that I feel like has been really missing from the conversation. And so this has been a really, really exciting uh, part of this work for me. Uh, one of the things that, um, that we have to be really thoughtful of, particularly around the issue of toxic stress is recognizing how we're able to, as we lift up this issue as a universal issue, because it is a universal issue, right? How do we not widen the gap by allowing those who have the resources to you know, access high quality resources while um, those who, who don't have adequate resources are left behind? And um, for me, answering that question in terms of how do we create the appropriate um, infrastructure to make sure that folks are rec receiving high quality interventions. And for me, part of that is, I believe that the medical community has a responsibility to lead that conversation um, as a health equity issue to address um, a lot of these issues of um, uh, early adversity, but also making sure that the infrastructure that's put in place, everyone has access to that. So can you say a little bit, I, I, you know, your thoughts about the medical community having some responsibility and then this idea that everyone feels so overwhelmed. They feel under-resourced and overwhelmed. And I think, you know, you've created a model with research and clinical practice and policy. Do you think that's the model that, that we need to bring into our communities, like really have those things working in the same center? Or do you think there's other ways we can integrate this work? I mean, sometimes it feels overwhelming. Yeah, um, a big part of what we do at the Center for Youth Wellness is um, by no stretch of the imagination do we believe that um, this is the model, right? Like w what we try to do is figure out, um, our center is essentially an innovation laboratory for coming up with solutions around this issue of um, ACEs and toxic stress. So when we're looking at a clinical protocol, I'm thinking to myself and our team is thinking, how can we do a clinical protocol that, that anyone can do, right? Or what is the, what is the minimum requirement and what do we ultimately want to advocate to say this is what primary care clinicians should be doing and this is here where we may need to set this, something up as like a like a subspecialty sub service right where you know maybe on a regional center or regional health systems will have uh, a toxic stress subspecialty clinic um, the way that they would have a cancer center or something along those lines uh, but what we are um, really aiming to do is identify what are the key components and and then try to be able to to lift those up and push those out and so for example screening is a big thing we've been working on a screening tool and that's um, one of the things that uh, we're heading into the process of validation in 2015 and we hope to be able to share widely as okay here's a great way that anyone who wants to screen can screen right and then as we're looking at our different clinical models and we're um, 
uh, working with our research team, what we'd like to be able to lift up is to say, okay, protocol A, you know, that was most effective. Protocol B, we didn't find success with it. This is what I would say. I don't, back in the day, pediatric uh, leukemia came with a 90% mortality rate. 90%. And pediatric oncologists from all around the country got together and created this thing called Pediatric Oncology Group. And they tested protocols. And you can have protocol, you know, 164789. You can have like the Atlanta 3B protocol, you know, whatever it is. I'm making that up. But the point is, they, 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 they tested and tried all these protocols, and they said, which one has the best survival rate? Today, pediatric leukemias come with a 90% survival rate, right? And it took decades of working together, trying different protocols, doing, and, and figuring out what was the most effective, people sharing that with other people, and then lifting that up, and now, you know, any pediatric oncologist can tell you, you know, if it's, you know, if it's ALL, we'll use this one. If it's a different kind of leukemia, we'll use this one. And that is what I hope to see happen with this issue of adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress, that we are able to do some kind of systematic evaluations of different interventions and lift up the ones that are most effective. I love that. Well, we will look forward to continuing to benefit from that. And I know there's a lot of great work here in Colorado going on as well. And I think just continuing to share that is going to be an important part of moving forward. So that's great. Um, so we've talked a lot about health impacts today, physical impacts. But another area that I've heard you talk about is the implications of toxic stress on a child's educational experience. And there are some pretty compelling data around how toxic stress does impact kids in the classroom. So can you talk a little bit about that data and then also maybe what our schools and teachers and systems can do to help support the kids in those situations? Um, so we, the first thing that we did after... I, uh, you know, my, my colleague showed me the, the adverse childhood experiences study was, you know, we looked at it, I was like, dang, that seems really compelling. But you know, whatever, this is a study, Kaiser, you know, maybe it's not even an issue, let's find out. <laughs> so we did a, a chart review, we looked at 702 patients that we saw uh, in the first two years at our clinic, and, um, and we looked at went back and documented their, their ACE scores, their Adverse Childhood Experience scores. And very similar to the study that was done by Kaiser and the CDC, we saw almost identical numbers. 67% uh, of our patients had at least one Adverse Childhood Experience, and 12% uh, of our uh, patients had an Adverse Childhood ex Experience score of uh, four or more. Now, the big difference was Kaiser asked adults so it was a self-report, and it was, you know, which of these happened to you before you were eight, 18? Um, in our situation, I, it, we were getting this from the medical chart. So, you know, I'm a mandated reporter. It's probably an under-report. Um, but, and, and the other thing was our mean age was eight years old, right? So these kids aren't done accumulating their ACE scores yet. And what we found was that for our kids with an ACE score of four or more, their relative risk of being overweight or obese compared to someone with a, a score of zero was double, and their relative risk of learning and behavior problems was 32.6. And um, the thing that was really powerful for us was that in our study when we looked at it, if our of our patients who had an A score of zero, only 3% of them had learning and behavior problems. These are all kids who are growing up in Bayview, Hunters Point. They're all going to underperforming schools, right? They're all black and brown kids living in the neighborhood. But if their A score was zero, the, only 3% of them had learning and behavior problems. And I think that was really, really, really promising. Because for me, I think that suggested that our kids are not inherently broken, right? But that they are manifesting symptoms of an exposure to a toxin, which is adversity. And for our kids who had an A score of four or more, 51.8% of them had learning and behavior problems in school, more than half. So for me, that really influenced our, um, our practice in suggesting that, you know, 
any kid who's being sent to me for, <laughs> please, can you write him a prescription for Ritalin? <laughs> the first thing that we're going to do is, is do that assessment and understand whether or not what this child is doing is actually manifesting symptoms of a, a toxic exposure to adversity. Thank you. You've talked about adversity. I heard you use the term um, doses of adversity, which again, takes it to such a pragmatic level. Can you just talk about that term? And what that sure. Means? You know, the reason I use the term uh, doses of adversity is because what Felidi and Anda found in their study was there was a dose-response relationship between adverse childhood experiences and health outcomes. So if you had an A score of, you know, one, two, three, four, you know, you would see the stepwise increase of your in your risk for everything from um, heart disease to asthma to hepatitis to cancer, and um, and I think that it's really important for us to think about what the dose of adversity is. Now, what the ACE study doesn't include it are things like community violence or um, uh, the the chronic stress of discrimination, for example which I think are also risk factors for toxic stress, and they, they are compounded, and so those are additional doses of adversity. Um, you know, we screen for homelessness as another dose of adversity. And so, um, uh, really looking at that and understanding that, um, it's, it, I, I have to say, it's just like lead, right? There's a certain dose at which, <laughs> you know, your physiology, uh, doesn't work well anymore, right? And, and, and we see that and it's really symptomatic. And so I think that what's awesome about it, what's so exciting for me, I gave a talk earlier this year and I got, you know, the guy, I was explaining the science and the guy said to me at the end, there was like one, everyone in the room was like, wow, that's really powerful. And one guy was like, well, isn't this just like social? Isn't this just like a, like a social problem? And I said, here's the difference between what we're talking about and a social problem. A social problem, you can say, well, that's a social problem, and therefore, it seems intractable, right? But if I know that the problem is that a dysregulated stress response system leads to very high uh, um, abnormal uh, circulating levels of adrenaline and cortisol that changes your serotonin receptors in your brain, right? All of those things are things that medicine is already trying to find a way to work on, right? So step one, we can start by reducing the dose of adversity. That's what we do for lead. That's what we do for tobacco. Let's just start by reducing the dose and figuring out how we as a society, whether you're in child welfare, early education, all of those things, how can we do, reduce the dose in whatever environment I'm working in? That's step one. Step two is figuring out when a child is exposed to high dose, and sometimes it's unavoidable, how do we treat what's going on in their bodies, right? So we use different modalities, and in addition to things like nurse home visiting, therapy, um, psychiatry, et cetera, we also use things like biofeedback, which, are, um, uh, which is focused on regulating the autonomic nervous system. Uh, we use things like mindfulness, which has been documented to not only um, help to, to uh, regulate the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, decrease circulating cortisol and adrenaline levels, but also decrease the inflammation. So decrease all of these things that lead to the heart disease, et cetera, right? So social, uh, I don't know, I don't have a treatment for social, right? But this stuff, understanding the mechanism, just like with HIV, right? It's a virus. Wait, no, no, snap. It's a, it's a retrovirus. How do we develop something that'll attack a retrovirus? Okay, we developed this thing. It's called antiretroviral medication, right? It takes a ton of research. Nobody knows going into it that that's necessarily what they're going to do. But you, when you understand, if we understand the mechanism, we can create interventions that will make it so that we don't have to, you know, it, this is not a foregone conclusion that, if you grow up in a household or in a community where this stuff is going on, that it's just your lot in life, that A, 
if you even end up making it through school, and if you end up being able to maintain employment, um, you're, you know, you're going to drop dead at heart disease, you know, 20 years earlier than anybody else. I mean, that's not a foregone conclusion. We have the resources, the technology, and m the wherewithal to, to be able to address that. So you can tell by the way you talk about this that you feel extremely hopeful, like we can do something about this. And I guess I wonder, you're working in a, a neighborhood that's faced with, fam with families that are faced with multiple challenges, you're trying to collect research, you're thinking about policy, like how do you stay as a person hopeful and, and about, about this when faced with so many challenges even every day in your clinic? Um. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Here's what's crazy. I kind of know, and I could be wrong, and if I am, I'll die before I find out, so that's okay. I know, I know, based on the science, number one. I know based on how common this is, number two, and how much of a public health crisis this is, that we are going to make huge strides over the next 30 years. I know that in the same way that we've made these strides for leukemia, we've made these strides for um, lead poisoning, we've made these strides for HIV AIDS, we've made these strides on tobacco. Like for this, it's, it, it, in my mind, it's a no brainer. I know that we are going to make these strides. And what's crazy for me is that I get to be part of that movement. And that is like, oh my God, you know, it's like, what an opportunity, what a reason to get out of bed in the morning. And for me, every roadblock that I hit against, for me, feels like these obstacles are the places where we can either succeed or not, right? So just having the, the gumption to get up in the morning and say, you know what? Yesterday was a killer day. I don't even know how we're gonna make it through. And then getting out of bed in the morning and, and facing it again, that is what makes the difference between success and failure. And so as, as far as I'm concerned, I am so psyched for the day when 30 years from now, you and I are kicking back somewhere, having a glass of wine, talking about, remember those days? I'm in. <laughs> right? I'm in. Yeah. Yes, yes, and I think the days when I need the um, gumption in the morning, I'm going to think about you. So that's But what's helpful. cool about it is, is that we are all part of that movement. And that is what makes me, it's like, uh, frankly, that's why I'm here today. And that's why I was so compelled with all of the work that you all are doing and the conversations that you and I have had was just like, listen, anyone who's got people together who are serious about doing this work, you, you count me in. All right, I'll take, I'll, I'll, I'll come, <laughs> I'll fly across the country. You count me in. We'll figure it out together, and we will, we'll chart that course, and then, um, you know, maybe we'll have a party, because there will be a lot of people, you know. It'll have to be a big bottle of wine. Uh, There'll be that guy on the plane. She gets off the plane yesterday. I pick her up, and she said, I said, how, is your, how are you? How was your flight? She goes, I sat next to this business consultant, and I was telling him about ACEs. I'm like, oh my God, she really is telling everyone about this. And she's like, he's going to do something about it, which leads to, I thought, you know, you could sit in the plane and talk to the person next to you about it. And that may be something we all should do. And it sort of leads to my last question, which is, you know, people in this room, um, you know, there's a lot of people in this room that leave and go, okay, yeah, I'm going to work on the policy. I'm going to go back to my, my pediatric practice and think about how I could do some of, um, incorporate some of this great work. But, you know, people will often come up and say, hey, you know, I'm a mom. I'm not necessarily involved in the, informally in the systems changes, or, you know, I, you know, I'm a grandparent and I want to do something. Can you just, um, you know, you've inspired us today, and I think people are ready to do something. Do you have advice for what people can do as they leave here today, like individuals, what can we do to be a part of bringing this issue forward? Yeah, well, that's, this is the only way this issue is going to move forward. Like, the, the, the only way that we're going to get to that, that glass of wine 30 years from now is um, when this is 
such household information, right? When everyone, listen, <laughs> do you all have those Geico commercials? The, do right? the little lizard. You know how Geico has now changed their commercials where they're like, oh, did you know you can get, or somebody else like, insurance, whatever, 15% minutes could save you 50% or more, right? Now, that's, a, that's an insurance commercial, and everybody knows it. <laughs> a lizard. <laughs> okay? When we get to the point where everybody knows that exposure to early adversity affects your health, behavioral, and educational lifelong outcomes, and it's a no-brainer, right? You see a, a, a lady on the... Uh, in the supermarket, and she's spanking her child, and you're like, oh, don't you know that if you do that, your child may have heart disease and asthma, right? <laughs> well, oh, I didn't realize, <laughs> right? This, when we, I think, that, I think that when we get to that point, so first, number one, I think, is um, um, for each of us to kind of educate ourselves about this issue, and I think we were able to throw out some highlights today, but there's um, there's a lot to it, and, and um, uh, there's some great uh, takeaways. And so I think educate ourselves. And then, yeah, talk to that guy sitting next to you on the plane or on the bus or in line at the bank. There is literally, if you meet me at a cocktail party, everybody who's met me at a cocktail party knows because they came away being like, wow, I had no idea. Adverse childhood experiences. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, each of us has our own um, sphere of influence, whether it's our household, whether it's even just about the way we raise our own children, right? Um, or the way that we do self-care, right? I mean, for a, even the, the ones of us uh, in the room right now who are in that relationship that's not that healthy and you're raising your, your kids in that situation, figuring out, okay, maybe I need to... To, to take this to a place where it's a little bit healthier. So uh, whether it's on the personal level, on the community level, I, advocating at your child's school to, to uh, move towards more uh, trauma-informed policies, away from uh, punitive uh, policies, and then, you know, to whatever field um, that we're in. I think that that is how uh, the movement builds. Uh, spreading the word, whether it's through media, whether it's um, through writing a blog, you know, we put it on Facebook, y'all, like whatever, whatever you're, uh, you know, t tweeting this conference uh, today, whatever it is, um, uh, doing that in, the, in your own little way. And I think that when we do that, um, it builds. So... That's inspiring. And I'm excited. I'm in for that glass of wine. I'm in for that party. We'll up it to champagne. Let's do it before 30 years. Um, but I think it is clear that you are going to be a visionary. I can't wait to see what you do next and what you continue to do. And I just want to thank you again for being with us and sharing not only the great science and information about your practice, but but really that hopeful perspective that I think we can bring with us um, as we move forward together with everybody in this room to work on this. So thank you again for all you're doing. My pleasure. Thank you.